If you've got a Bible, go ahead and take it. I'm going to read our passage this morning from Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32. I'm just going to read through it real quick and then I'll pray. Psalm 32 says this, a mascal of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose, son, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And this is God's word. Let's pray and just ask for his help as we uh, study this, uh, this text. Father God, thank you for uh, such an encouraging psalm that even though it deals with our sinfulness, Lord, more than it deals with our sinfulness, it deals with your great capacity and willingness to forgive. God, I pray that as we just reflect on your forgiveness this morning, you would stir our hearts, stir our affections for love for you, praise for your name. God, I pray that you would, uh, if there be any sin in us, Lord, you would even use our reflecting on your kindness to us to convict us of sin and then open up a a wide opportunity for us to confess it for a clean conscience that we would know your forgiveness in in a fresh way this morning. God, I pray if there's anybody who is listening who does not know your forgiveness, who is still under the the weight and the guilt of their sin, Lord, that even today, this morning, they would know what it looks like to have that, that guilt lifted off, that they would know forgiveness and righteousness and holiness in you. God, I pray that you would, you would hold up your kindness to us in Jesus Christ through this text. Give us, give us your help. Give us uh, clear thoughts. Give me clear words. God, and help us to just, just to see you afresh this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you are standing, you can go ahead and be seated. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Shane. I am one of the pastors here at IDC and have the privilege of opening this text uh, to you this morning. Uh, I have, uh, I picked this psalm. I wanted to, to reflect a little bit on the blessing of being forgiven for a couple reasons this morning. The first one is that in a time of great turmoil and uncertainty, there are many blessings that we have that have really been stripped away in a lot of ways. And the the loss or the hurt or the pain of not being able to experience those blessings can sometimes, I think, cloud our minds and our, our sights of some of those blessings that we can never lose. At least this is something that I know I struggle with. And so I want us to reflect on forgiveness this morning because even in this crisis, if you have been forgiven in Christ Jesus, you have something to celebrate. Yes, this, this is a time of mourning for, for lots of reasons and for all of us hitting us in different ways. But it is not absolute mourning. Christ is still king and his forgiveness is still sweet and that gives us something to rejoice in. And this psalm leads us in that path. The second reason I wanted to address this theme is because crises kind of cause us to, to reevaluate big questions, don't they? They make us to think about some, some of the things that our lives and things, uh, just big answers to big life questions. And you might know someone who is wrestling with some of these questions, or if in the Lord's providence, he has led you to tune in this morning, you might be wrestling with some of these questions and you need big answers to those big questions. And if that's you, I want to encourage you and welcome you to look at Psalm 32, and I want to hold out to you the best answer that we have. Amen. 
in Christ Jesus, you can receive the blessing of forgiveness from your sins and acceptance by the God who created you. And no virus and no job loss and no lockdown and no isolation can ever take away his love from you. And the third reason I want to reflect on this theme of forgiveness is one that really it transcends this, this shutdown time. The forgiveness that we receive from God is meant, according to the scriptures, to be kind of a, a cornerstone for the, the relational dynamic between God's people. In Colossians tree, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And yet... I've found time and time again in my own life and from many others that I have an impressive ability to invent all kinds of excuses for my own lack of forgiveness. And I must confess that I only make these excuses when I lose sight of the blessing that I have in my forgiveness. And so this morning, Psalm 32 gets to hold up the the forgiveness of God for us, and it forces us to, to stare at what we have received in Jesus, and it will at least cause us to ask the question, why could we possibly withhold forgiveness from one another? And so there's three reasons. We could probably name many more, but that is, I think, reason enough for us to look at forgiveness in Psalm 32. I just want us to look at the the blessing of forgiveness from about five different angles. Uh, That might scare you because Tony already set me up to try to go short. I'm going to try, but no promises, okay? Uh, Psalm 32, five different angles uh, for us to consider the the blessing of forgiveness. (laughs) You're forgiven. I I forgive you for uh, for setting me up like that for failure. Uh, This is good. We're, we're, We're practicing forgiveness, yeah. The first one I want you to see is the the anatomy of forgiveness. You see this in verses 1 and 2, which really serve as as kind of the theme. They introduce the theme and the subject of these verses. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It just starts off on this this high note in which we are, are called to reflect on the greatness of God's forgiveness for us. But within these two verses, we get something of, of a little bit of a structure and an anatomy of how forgiveness works. There's at least in, in the this language, there's at least three images of forgiveness given to us. The first is that transgression is forgiven. It's an image that that helps us think about the the sin being taken away, being lifted away. Psalm chapter 103 verse 12 says, as far as the east and the is from the west, our our transgressions are taken away from us. That's the image of our, our transgressions being forgiven. Sin is also in these verses, it is covered. It is out of sight. God, in a sense, puts something over it. He refuses to look over, look at it anymore. It's, it's covered over. It's taken out of sight. He doesn't want to look at it anymore. And that helps us understand a little bit about what's happening when our sin is brought to the Lord, when it's forgiven. It's not like he's staring at it all the time. Instead, he's, he's covered over it. He's, he's taking it away out of sight. He's not just sitting there just smoldering on it or just marinating on it, just how dare they or anything. What the Lord does is he covers it. He puts it in a, in a corner and he puts all the other stuff over top of it. He doesn't want to look at it. The last image is in the words, the Lord counts no iniquity. This idea of iniquity is, is guilt. The sin that we truly do commit against God, it isn't counted against us. God God sees the sin, right? We don't want to imagine that our sin is actually taken where God can't see it. God knows all things. He sees all things. He doesn't forget like as though he gets amnesia. But what he does is he commits something. He commits that he is not going to count our sins against us. He's not going to, to dangle it over our sins. He's not going to judge us for it. It's actually accounting terminology, th- this idea of sin being being covered. He, he's not going to, the, the theological word here is impute. He's not going to impute our sins to us. He's not going to, to kind of keep a ledger of them and say, you've got to pay for all of this. In Romans 4, Paul quotes directly from this passage in order to talk about the very nature of the gospel. And it works both ways. He's using this language of imputing or counting. He says, in the gospel, our our sin is not counted against us. That is kind of the blessing. That is what the good news of the gospel is. You are a sinner. And yet, in God's kindness, the sin is not counted against you. 
But there's more to it, Paul says. Not only is your sin not counted against you, but by faith in Jesus, his righteousness, his perfection, his holiness is counted towards you. Now you caught that, right? It's not your righteousness. It's not your holiness. It's not your godliness. It is his that is counted to you. And so there's some some goofy accounting going on. You don't want to submit this to the SEC. They will flag it. But in God's economy here, this is how the gospel works. He, in his forgiveness, does not count his iniqui- our, our iniquity against us, but instead he counts something else for us. The, the implication here, I think, is, is beginning to become obvious, and then it will, will flesh out more in the rest of the psalm. We do not have to pretend that we don't have any sin. This is one of the, the great trappings that we have, is that we like to imagine that we're better than we are. And even if we recognize that we are uh, uh, sinners or we're not quite what, we supposed, or what we're supposed to be, we like to think that we can get there. Right? We are the ones who can get us to a point where we don't really need this forgiveness. We think that our forgiveness actually depends on us in some way. And what Psalm 32 is saying is that our forgiveness actually depends on acknowledging ourselves as in desperate need of forgiveness. We are sinners. No one will be forgiven who does not first acknowledge their need for pardon. Augustine was a great church father in the 3rd and 4th century. He etched Psalm 32 on the wall next to his deathbed. It was one of his favorite passages. And as he wrote it there, had it written there, he said that the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. We cannot truly understand ourselves or our God rightly if we do not first acknowledge ourselves to be a sinner. And then once we come to God with this sin, that is where his forgiveness meets us. It does not meet someone who is, who is hiding our own sin, but it meets the one who acknowledges his own sin. I think this is the meaning of chapter two, the second, or sorry, verse two, the second line. It says that blessed is the one in whose spirit there is no deceit. What he's not saying there is that, oh, oh yeah, also blessed are the sinners who are forgiven, but also blessed are the perfect ones, the ones who don't need the forgiveness. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is blessed are the ones who are going to be honest about their need for forgiveness. They are not deceiving themselves. They're not deceiving anybody else. They, they come to the Lord without pretense of being perfect. They know themselves to be a sinner and they do not pretend otherwise. This, this pretending to not need forgiveness actually launches the psalmist into his own experience of forgiveness in verses three through five. The psalmist gives us a little bit of autobiography. Uh, He tells us, this is kind of how I got to this place. Tradition tells us that the the psalmist is David. You can see it there in the title. David is telling us that he had for a season wrestled with not really being honest, not being real about his own sin. He's hiding it. He's covering over it. Now, it's not the same kind of covering that happens in verse 1. The Lord covering our sin is an act of forgiveness. Us covering over our sin is an act of of hiding. And the effect of this hiding for for David is some kind of of emotional or psychological and and possibly even physical distress. Look in verses 3 through 5. There's a couple phrases here that show us how kind of tormented David is. He says, my bones wasted away. I was groaning all day long. He says, my strength was dried up. You ever, he says, like, like in the heat of summer, we live in a place that gets fairly hot. And if you go out in the middle, of summer, uh, if we're allowed to do that by by then, uh, you will be reminded that uh, if you stand, go outside for very long at all, it just zaps the strength out of you, right? It just, it just sucks all of the energy out of your life. And he's saying, he's saying, I, I feel that way. He's in turmoil. Why? Why? Because I kept silent. Kids, you probably can relate to this feeling, can't you? You know the time when maybe you've broken something in the house or maybe you've broken a rule that mom or dad have laid out for you. And when you break it, they don't immediately catch you, right? 
Mom and dad don't immediately find out, but you know that you've done something wrong. And so you do a couple things. One, you try to, you try to fix it a little bit, right? You try, to, you try to cover up your own mistake. And then two, you kind of like try to, try to distract. Maybe you try to make sure mom and don't, dad don't find it. And even if for a little while you, you think, man, maybe I got away with this, you're living on, in fear, right? You're living in this kind of sense of, man, I really hope this doesn't come out. I hope that my own failure, my own sin, mom and dad are eventually going to find out. And so you can't really ever relax. You can't really rest until the sin is actually uncovered. I heard an amazing story on a podcast this week about a man named Bill Henry. Not the most descriptive name, fairly generic, that actually comes into play here. See, Bill Henry passed away in Florida in 2007, and he spent the last 20 years of his life impersonating a mo- another man named Bill Henry. Now, he didn't have to change his name to Bill Henry. They were both named Bill Henry. Now, the other Bill Henry, the guy that he was impersonating, was a 16-year Major League Baseball player in the 1950s and 60s. He even pitched in a World Series. He made it to an all-star game. He was a reliever. Wasn't like a, 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 an all, you know, a big star, superstar, but he was, I mean, 16 years is a long time to play Major League Baseball. And so this, not fake Bill Henry, he was a real Bill Henry, but the, the impersonator, right? At one point, he moves to Florida, and he just decides he's going to pretend to be Bill Henry. Uh, And luckily, he had the same name, right? He was the exact same height. He was also a left-handed guy. And so, this is the 50s and 60s, right? It's not like people were just Googling him and pulling up a picture. And so, for 20 years, Bill Henry, the fake one, pretends to be Bill Henry, the baseball player. He's got stories. He's got... He marries a lady, right? Under the pretense of being the baseball player, she never finds out until after he's dead when the obituary is run and then the real Bill Henry reads about his own death in the newspaper and gets very confused because he's definitely not dead. And as I was listening to this podcast, it was funny because that one of the things that the hosts were discussing was how traumatic it would be to live that life. Like just knowing that somebody at some point is going to find out. Like, that's quite the gamble to get married under the pretense of being somebody else, not to mention to do all these other things, tell the stories, all that kind of thing. And so the podcast hosts were just discussing, would they be able to do this? Would they be able to live under the pretense of being a Major League Baseball player when, in fact, you were not? You and I have probably never carried off such a scam like that. I hope not. If you are, we'll find out um, because we do have Google. But the psalmist felt something like this. He felt some kind of angst. He knew he was living a lie. He was trying to fool everyone. He was trying to fool even himself, possibly. And he was definitely trying to fool the Lord. And it was tormenting him. Verse 4 adds a layer to the torment. It wasn't just, it wasn't simply a, a, a conscience issue for him. Verse 4 tells us it was the Lord's hand that was pressing down on him. This turmoil wasn't just simple like fatigue at trying to keep a con going. It was the disciplining hand of God. It was God himself who was convicting David for his unconfessed sin, convicting David for remaining silent and therefore his bones are wasting away and his groaning all day long and his strength being sapped out of him. And this makes me think that there are several things worth noting here about this experience David goes under. The first is that it is a kindness of the Lord not to let us chase after sin with a clear conscience. Think about how merciful God is for not just letting us run into sin. I mean, David right here is saying he's, he's got sin that's unconfessed. And, and the reason he's feeling this kind of conviction and angst is because God kind of chases after him. He's actually going after him. What if God had not done that? What would have kept David from just running headlong into sin? And James chapter 1 tells us that the end of sin is death and destruction. This is what happens when we give ourselves over to sin, is that we're leading into something that truly does destroy us and others. It was a kindness of the Lord to not let him chase after it. Mm 
Second thing we ought to notice is that we should not confuse the discipline of God with the judgment of God. Hebrews 12 tells us that he disciplines those he loves. It is God's love that compels him to go after David. The judgment is deserved, but it is poured out on another. That's the whole story of the gospel is that that David deserves the judgment. And yet, it is poured out on someone else, namely the Messiah, Christ himself. But, but God doesn't just therefore say, go do whatever you want. What he does still is he goes after us and he disciplines his beloved. And so we ought not to confuse the disciplining hand of God with the judgment of God. It might be, Christian, that you undergo discipline in your life. It might be the heavy hand of God on you that is calling you to repentance. That is not his judgment. That is his kind, loving discipline. The third thing I want us to consider briefly is that our consciences are relevant in our obedience to God. While a guilty conscience is not always a perfect indicator of God's will for our lives, If we are in Christ and have the Spirit of God, we ought to consider whether a guilty conscience is showing us some sin in our lives. We ought to be sensitive to the Spirit of God working in us. If we feel the heavy hand of God in us, if we feel this kind of conviction, if we feel that we are are, are groaning and our bones are wasting away, we ought to at least ask the question, is there something God is trying to show me in this time because it might be his heavy hand that is that is calling you to uncover some kind of sin so that he might forgive it. The, the psalmist David learned this lesson in verse 5. The sinner awakens from his unrepentant slumber and he turns to God. He brings his sin into the light. He confesses it. He makes it known. There's there's three phrases in verse 5 that that show what he does. It says, I acknowledged my sin. Rather than denying it, he no longer has to pretend it's not there. I'm I'm just going to own the fact that this is here. I did not cover. Rather than hiding his sin, he he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't blame shift it. He doesn't excuse it away. Instead, he he brings it into the light. He makes it known to God. And then third, he says, I will confess. Rather than staying silent, he, he names the sin for what it is. This is what I've done. This is who I've been. This is what I deserve. But notice here in, in verse 5, and the, set, the last line, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Isn't it just fascinating that the thing that we fear most about confessing our sin is actually the thing we're least in danger of if we confess it. We, we fear the condemnation, right? We fear the shame. And no sooner does David say, I confess it all, than he says, God took it all away. That is the promise of confession. We are so scared of the condemnation, but when we are scared like that, we're, we're losing sight of what God has promised to do in the gospel. We make it known. He takes care of it. That's the promise of the gospel. The result of confession is forgiveness. The Lord does not hold sin against the repentant. And if we confess our sin and run to the Lord rather than run away from Him, we will surely find forgiveness. And we need to keep in mind, Christian, this is not just for the unbeliever. Yes, we go to the lost. We go to those who are not Christians and we say, stop running after sin, run to God. There you will find forgiveness. There you will find life in his son, Jesus Christ. But it's also true that even for the Christian, right? This is, this is King David here, right? He was God's man over Israel. He goes to the Father. He goes to God, and he confesses his sins. Brother, sister, if we have our sin, it is no less true that when we go to him, we find that same relief, same rescue, same promise that those sins are covered, that they're taken far away. And we, we know this, right? We feel the same experience. Even as Christians, we still sin, and we still feel the temptation to hide it and to cover it and to minimize it. And every single time when it's brought into the light, you know what we're met with? The same grace that we first encountered in Christ. So the simple question I have for you is this. Is there unconfessed sin in your life? Anything. Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? And I just want to ask you, 
Why hold on to it? What advantage do you think you possibly are holding on to by, by covering it, by keeping silent? Psalm 32 is saying there is no advantage. There's only disadvantage by holding on to it. There is only every advantage in running to the Lord. So this is his experience of forgiveness, which launches him into the promise of forgiveness in verses 6 and 7. In these verses, there is both promise and warning. He, he begins by exhorting, not really directly to everyone, but he just says, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. He's so relieved by his forgiveness that he just wants everybody to feel this. Surely in the rush of great waters, verse 6, they shall not reach him. There's great promise in these verses. God's righteous judgment against sin, which I think is one way to understand the great waters. Everything that is rightly poured out on God's sinful creation. It says it will not reach him. His right just judgment against sin will actually be, will be protected against. Why? Because we run to the Lord. In order to escape the just judgment of our sin, we run to our God. This is the gospel, is it not? Though he and he alone is right to judge us, he and he alone can save us. Notice the great waters, they're not going to reach him because he runs to the God the righteous judge. And there, instead of finding judgment, instead of finding condemnation, instead of finding shame, he finds a hiding place. He finds one who will preserve him from trouble. Not only will he preserve him from trouble, but he will shout deliverance over us. He will celebrate his victory. It's such a, a clear picture of the gospel. The God who can rightly judge us instead comes to us in the person of his son and claims us for himself. And when he gets us, he celebrates over us. We run to him, not as judge, but as savior and Lord. And there we find a hiding place. There we find preservation from our trouble. No, that does not mean that everything in this life will be easy. No, this does not mean that there will not be coronaviruses or job losses or anything else. But what it does mean is that we have somewhere to go. We don't just have a place to go. We have the place to go. The one who is able to save has promised himself to us. There is a great promise here. But there's also a warning, isn't there? There's a caution Verse 6, it says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. When you may be found. It is at least implying that there is an urgency here. This is not something we should, we should linger on. David says, Do not be slow to deal with your sin. Do not play around with it. Do not coddle it. Do not delay. It is the Lord's kindness and patience that allows us time to wrestle and feel conviction and repent. The question we have to ask is, should we respond to that kindness with laziness, with apathy, with not taking our sin seriously? This is a, a repeated theme in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, today is the day of salvation. And we can ask the question, Kind of who is Paul talking to in First Corinthians, in Second Corinthians chapter two? For whom is today the day of salvation? And I think the answer in Second Corinthians six. I think the answer in Psalm thirty-two. I think the answer in Psalm ninety-five, verses seven and eight. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. The answer is, if you are hearing it, today is the day, friend. If you're joining us and you have not, do not have peace with your God because of Christ Jesus. I just want you to, to hear loud and clear. Today is the day of your salvation. Today it is held out to you. You're, you're hearing this message. You're hearing the promise that if you run to this God and accept his forgiveness because of what he's done for you, not because of what you have to do, but because of what he's done for you, today is the day of salvation. You do not have to wonder, is this for me? If you're hearing his voice, if you're hearing this word, it's for you, right? This is held out to you. It's like the, uh, the, the, the repeated line from Dead Poets Society, right? 
carpe diem, seize the day. This is what Robin Williams' character went around to the boys. Seize the day, act now, do it today. Well, friends, today, if you are hearing his voice, do not harden your hearts. The same would be true if you're a Christian. Christian, if you have sin that you're aware of and you have not confessed it, you have not brought it into the light, you have not brought it to the Lord, today, go to him at a time when he may be found. Today is the day. That's the promise and that's the warning. Fourth, I want you to see the lesson of forgiveness. David now turns to provide instruction directly. It's interesting that someone who experiences the grace of God then turns directly and he wants to share it with others, isn't it? I think this is a natural kind of outflow of the life of someone who has been forgiven of their sin, is that they know that there are other sinners out there and they too need forgiveness. And so, David experiences this and then he turns and says, I want to instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. It's unclear if the psalm is now speaking kind of for God. There's some of your Bibles might have a, a capital M when it talks about my eye is upon you in, in verse 8, uh, or if this is just David continuing to t- talk. I don't think it really affects the, the, the interpretation that much. The idea is the same. David, the Lord, he wants others to learn from David's journey. He doesn't want them to hide their sin. He doesn't want them to recoil and and be oppressed. He doesn't want them to have this same turmoil and disobedience of not running to the Lord. And so he uses an illustration. He gives us an illustration in verse 9. He says, don't be like a horse or a mule. And the point he's trying to make here is that a horse and a mule, they always need to kind of be coerced into obedience, right? You don't just sit down uh, uh, and reason with a horse and a mule. I'm not going to compare mules and babies, but this is one of the things I had to learn when I first had children, right? Is that I, as a a reasonable adult, want to look at a one-year-old and say, explain to me what is going on, right? And the one-year-old just looks up and blah, 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 right? Like they don't, you can't reason with them. Well, the same thing is true with a horse and a donkey, okay? You can look them in the eye and you can say, let's make a plan. It's not going to work, right? And it's not really their fault. They're horses and donkeys, right? But he's saying, you don't be the same way. Don't be such that the only way you're going to learn and grow and obey is if that discipline disciplining hand comes upon you. You don't want to be the person who is only going to experience this kind of forgiveness when the heavy hand of God comes upon you. It, that, that's what the, the point of the, the last line of, of verse 9. It must be curbed with bit and brittle or it will not stay near to you. Well, you also don't want to be like a horse or a mule that do not learn this lesson. You don't want to be the kind of person who always has to be, in a sense, retaught that, that there, is, there is discipline for our lack of confession. Why? Why don't you just want to receive the discipline all the time? Why don't you just want to, to be the one who is kind of under the threat of God's disciplining hand or, or anything like that? Well, he tells us in verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. I think that wicked is referring to those who will not repent. They will not confess. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. There is a, a deep contrast between those who refuse to acknowledge their sin and those who run to the Lord in trust. They are both, get this in that one verse, they are both overwhelmed with something. Isn't it interesting in that verse? They are both kind of overcome with something. The wicked are overwhelmed with sorrows. Those who refuse to to learn from what David is giving us here, they're going to be overwhelmed with sorrows. Why? Because they're living their lives, giving themselves over to sin and rebellion and transgression. And all of that is only going to lead to sorrow and destruction and death. But the repentant are overwhelmed with something else, aren't they? They're overwhelmed with steadfast love. It surrounds them. It is an all-encompassing thing. Everywhere they look, when they run to the Lord, they find love and kindness. It It is a persevering love that he has for us. Once again, showing us that what we fear we're going to encounter when we confess our sins is the exact opposite of what we receive. We trust the Lord 
And what we're met with is his kindness and his love and his grace. That's the lesson of forgiveness. I love where this psalm concludes, though. It wants us to get the the, the full picture. David ends this psalm with a call for us to understand and experience the joy of forgiveness. He says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Our response to his loving kindness, our response to his grace, is to sing. It's to worship. When we, like Augustine, understand ourselves to be deep, deep sinners who have been forgiven, the natural result of experiencing and receiving that that forgiveness is to rejoice. This is why Paul can say that even as he's going through lots of trials and difficulties in this life, he is sorrowful, but always rejoicing. We as Christians, yes, we're going to experience things like this season in our lives. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. But we can always rejoice. Why? Because there is literally no trial or tribulation in this life that can take away the forgiveness that God has given you. There is nothing that the enemy can throw at you that will take away this joy of being forgiven. And if we do not rejoice at the Lord's forgiveness... It cannot be, but it has to be because we do not fully understand the depth of our plight. It's almost as though the the, the full weight of our sin has not really landed on us. You know, if I'm carrying a heavy burden and you lift it off my shoulders, I immediately kind of collapse with thanksgiving. Thank you so much. You know, but if I'm just walking around, I don't know, with like a bag full of papers or something like that. Let me let me carry that. Again, carrying in the groceries. If you've got kids or maybe that person who comes like at the last, the last trip out to the car, uh, you know what I'm talking about? All the groceries have been brought in, but they come in and they get, let me, let me get this last thing. And it's like, you know, a thing of cheese or something like that. You're like, thanks, I guess. You know, like I appreciate the, the gesture. Sometimes I think we, we treat the Lord's forgiveness like it's that last little bag of cheese rather than the weight that has been lifted off of our shoulders. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he sent his son to make it possible that our guilt could be counted to him and not to us. And his perfect righteousness could be counted to us in its place. He, Jesus Christ, is the one who protects us against great waters. He, Jesus Christ, is the one who shields us from the judgment that we deserve. He, Christ, is the one who never needed forgiveness so that he could secure ours. And friends, today it is held out to us. What will be our response How will we respond even as everything chaotically is going on around us? If that forgiveness is yours, then we must respond with shouts of joy. If you're a Christian, but once again you suffer under the weight of unconfessed sin, I want you once again to bring it into the light and once again to experience the full joy of knowing that it is totally dealt with. You don't have to do anything else to it. You bring it to the Lord and he says, I will take this. I will take this for you. And once again, your response will be shouting for joy. Non-Christian, whether you know it or not, you are under the weight and the guilt of your sin and rebellion. And it is a, we don't say this lightly, it is a terrifying thing to be under the judgment of Almighty God. But there's good news. The promise of forgiveness is available to you as well. Today, even today, call out to the one he has sent to make your forgiveness secure, Jesus Christ. He is able and willing to save, as this psalm says, with shouts of deliverance. It would be his delight to rescue you from your sin. You must just turn away from trusting in yourself, from hiding your sin, from hiding your rebellion, and turn to the God who created you. And there you will find every shelter you will ever need.
Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. This is the forgiveness that is promised to us. And so, like this psalm tells us, I think the appropriate response for us is to sing with shouts of joy. So let me pray, and then Donnie, you can come lead us. Father God, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for the promise of forgiveness. Thank you, Lord that we not only don't have to deal with our sin, but that we can't deal with our sin, and yet you have promised to do it for us. And so I pray for the IDC Church family, I pray for my own heart, that even in the trials and the tribulations of this particular season, that we would be those who are marked with thanksgiving because we are blessed as those who have been forgiven. And give us great energy and joy and, and passion as we go to those who might not know that forgiveness and extend it out to them, that, that even today in the coming days would be the day of salvation for many who right now are suffering under the weight and the guilt of their own sin. May it be, Lord, that you get to shout deliverance over them with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.